Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Welch. In this short take, I'm going to talk about type 1 and type 2 errors. A little caution here. I'm going to assume you know something about 95% confidence intervals and p-values. If you don't, you might want to watch my short takes on those subjects prior to watching this video. I'm also going to assume you know something about diagnostic test performance. Not a lot. I just want to make sure you're familiar with the 2x2 two two table, which you're probably most familiar with in terms of calculating sensitivity and specificity. You ready? Here goes. Statistical tests can be wrong. That's not all that surprising. It's just like diagnostic tests. They can be wrong. Here's a 2x2 two two table for diagnostic test performance. The columns are the disease status. The rows are the test results. If the disease is present and the patient has a positive test result, we call that a true positive. If the disease is absent and the patient has a negative test result, we call that a true negative. That's the good diagonal. Now, if the disease is absent but the patient has a positive test result, we call that a false positive. And conversely, if the disease is present and the patient has a negative test result, we call that a false negative. So that's all review. Let's move to the 2x2 two two table for statistical test performance. Now the columns are about reality. And the rows are about the study result. If the reality is that treatment makes a difference, and our study result finds that treatment appears to make a difference, that's a true positive. If the reality is treatment makes no difference, and our study result is treatment appears to make no difference, that's a true negative. Now, let's say the reality is treatment makes no difference, but our study result suggests that treatment appears to make a difference. You might want to call that a false positive. That's too easy. That is a type 1 error. And conversely, if the reality is treatment makes a difference, and treatment, the study result is that treatment appears to make no difference, you might want to call that a false negative. But that's not right. Here we call that a type 2 error. So here's the complete table for statistical test performance. False positives and false negatives have been replaced with type 1 and type 2 errors. What's a type 1 error? Well, it's analogous to the false positive, and you might think of it as concluding there is a difference when in fact there is not. What's a type 2 error? Well, that's analogous to the false negative, and you might think of it as concluding there is no difference when in fact there is. So here's the complete table, and I want to focus on how we characterize the study result. Here we characterize it as appears to make a difference and appears to make no difference. But that's not formally how we do it. It's about a statistical test, which, in which we either reject the null hypothesis or accept the null hypothesis. I know, that'll give some statisticians conniptions. We don't really accept null hypotheses. We fail to reject them. But I hope you allow me this shorthand here. How do we decide whether to reject or accept the null hypothesis? Well, that's based on the p-value. If the p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than or equal to 0.05, we accept the null hypothesis. So here's what you should know so far. 1. Statistical tests can be wrong, just like diagnostic tests. 2. A type 1 error is concluding there is a difference when in fact there is not. It is a false positive statistical test. A type 2 error is concluding there is no difference when in fact there is. It's a false negative statistical test. And four, in the statistical setting, the diagnostic test is the p-value, for which the test threshold is typically 0.05.
So let's look at this study. Patients in the control group required more cataract surgery than those in the intervention group. 15% versus 8%, P equals 0.01. What do you conclude? Well, you reject the null hypothesis. Why? Because the p-value is less than 0.05. You assert there is a significant difference. Now here's the question. What is the chance of a type 1 error? Well, if you've determined that the study is positive, then the p-value is the probability that that study is a false positive, a type 1 error. That's interesting. Let's look at the 2 by 2 table for statistical tests. We're on this row. We've rejected the null hypothesis. The probability of the type 1 error in that setting is the p-value. So in this study, the probability of a type 1 error is 1%, or p equals 0 0.01. What's the chance of a type 2 error? Well, this is one of the few areas of medicine where you can only make one mistake at a time. Look at the 2 by 2 table. You're on this row. If you're on this row, you can't be down here. You can't make a type 2 error once you've rejected the null hypothesis. All right, new study. Patients taking Maxol had a higher risk of developing colonic adenomas than patients in the placebo group. RR equals 1.4, P equals 0 0.20. What do you conclude? Well, you accept the null hypothesis. You assert there is no significant difference. What's the chance of a type 1 error? It's a trick question. Because this is one of the few areas of medicine where you can only make one mistake at a time. Look at the 2 by 2 table. You're down on this row. You can't be up here. Once you've accepted the null hypothesis, you cannot make a type 1 error. What's the chance of a type 2 error? Well, this will be totally unsatisfactory to you, but the answer is it depends. Type 2 errors are tough. We're down on this row. What does a type 2 error depend on? Well, it depends on the 95% confidence interval and what you decide constitutes a difference that should not be missed. In other words, it depends on a value judgment. Here's how I think about it. Treatments can create benefit and they can create harm. And they can be somewhere in between. No effect, no difference between the two groups. And if that metric used to judge that is a relative risk, that's where the relative risk equals 1. Now, I'll make a value judgment. I assert that differences less than 10% are clinically unimportant. In terms of benefit, I want to see something more than an RR of 0 0.9. I want to see decreases of 25%, 50% in the outcome. And if, before I worry about harm, I want to see something more than a 10% increase in the outcome. So, I'm looking for R's greater than 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 5. So, these are 10% differences on either side. And this area in between, I'm going to call the don't care zone. It's just small stuff. Now, let's put some studies up here. There's a couple of studies, each with the main effect, what was actually observed, and the 95% confidence interval. It's all in the don't care zone. There's a low chance of a clinically important effect. Could one exist? Yes, but it's vanishingly unlikely. It's a low chance of a type 2 error. Now let me make a little space, put the don't care zone up at the top and add two more studies. Well, they're really different, aren't they? Neither of those studies is statistically significant. And some of the confidence interval is in the don't care zone. But most of the confidence interval is outside of the don't care zone. 
as is the main effects of the study. There's a high chance of a clinically important event. In the top line, it looks like there's some real benefit. In the bottom line, it looks like there's some real harm. There's a high chance of a type 2 error. So here are some more things you should know. One, when it comes to type 1 and type 2 errors, you can only make one mistake at a time. Two, if a study reports a statistically sig significant difference, that is, the p-value is less than 0.05, the chance of a type 1 error is the reported p-value. And finally, if a study reports no significant difference, the p is greater than or equal to 0.05, then the chance of a type 2 error depends on the 95% confidence interval and what you think constitutes a clinically important effect. A little bit of parting advice. Worry less about type 1 errors. By convention, they happen less than 5% of the time. Worry more about type 2 errors. That's where you really have to think. And as I said before, a conclusion based on a study with an extremely low p-value that is highly significant and has an extremely tight 95% CI, that is, it's very precise, can nonetheless be extremely wrong. But it's not because of a type 1 error. It's because of something else. It's because of something about the study design. That's why I want you to worry a lot more about the study design. I hope this helps.